recently I was out to dinner with a couple couples, and one of those couples was a great, uh, had a great Protestant who loved scripture, and he asked us, how, how do you Catholics, why do you Catholics make such a big deal out of Mary? And, you know, I know from the Protestant perspective, you've probably heard that question before. Protestants think, well, this Marian devotion is distracting us from devotion to Jesus Christ. And so one of the things I did is I started going to a couple biblical passages and showing how Scripture is devoted to Mary and that Scripture shows that Mary has an important role in the kingdom of God and in Jesus' plan of salvation. And he was blown away at the end of that conversation saying, I have asked Catholics many, many times and I've never gotten an answer that led me into the Word of God and taught me the Word of God like that before. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, how Mary and Marian devotion is deeply biblical, but more importantly, it leads us to Jesus Christ. Joining me tonight as a special guest is Dr. Brant Petrie, who is a professor of scripture here at the Augustine Institute and a renowned biblical scholar. He's written many, many academic books as well as many, many popular books. You might have seen some of his Lexio Bible studies on Formed. And he has a new Lexio Bible study out, uh, Lexio Mary, uh, the Bible and the Mother of God. And I love what you do here, Brant, in this study, is you really dive deeply into Mary mm -hmm. through scripture and showing the biblical roots of Marian devotion, which so many Catholics don't know, not even mention Protestants. Absolutely, yeah, no, this is, uh, when we were talking about future Lexio projects, this was one that was very close to my heart, because in my own experience as a cradle Catholic, I grew up knowing what to believe about mm -hmm. Mary. I also grew up practicing certain devotions to Mary, like the rosary. Um, but I didn't know why <laughs> we believed those things, and certainly didn't know where they were grounded in sacred scripture. So um, over the years, especially as I began to study more, not just of the New Testament, but of the Old Testament background, as well as ancient Jewish traditions about the mother, uh, about the Messiah and about his mother, which there are yeah. some, um, it became, it gradually dawned on me that one of the reasons so many Christians and, and also so many Catholics can't see clearly the biblical foundations of what we believe about Mary or various Marian devotions is because we're looking at the New Testament uh, passages that relate to Mary, which are, you know, they're, they're substantial, but they're not anywhere near as, as many as about Jesus or about Peter. But we, we tend to look at those passages in isolation, yeah. right? So if you're looking for like the phrase immaculate conception in the New Testament, you're not going to find it. Yep. If you're looking for an account of Mary's bodily assumption into heaven, you're not going to find it. If you're uh, looking for an explicit statement about her perpetual virginity, you're actually going to find passages that look like they contradict it, like mentions of the brothers of Jesus. And what I discovered is every time there's a major Marian belief that Catholics have, if we look at the New Testament in light of the Old Testament, mm -hmm and in light of ancient Christian writings, the early church fathers, we put it in that broader context, all of a sudden it becomes really clear that what Catholics believe about Mary is not only deeply biblical, but based on what we believe about Christ. You know, that method is so simple, but so profound, Brent. <laughs> you know, the idea that you take the New Testament in the context of the Old Testament, right. and there's a reason why God waits to reveal the new. He's preparing for the new yeah. through the Old Testament re revelation. Absolutely. And that's so important to understand the new, but then to see how the first Christians in those first several centuries, yeah. how they, pa passing on the apostolic tradition, understood that New Testament. You put both those together, and you get a very Catholic read, That's, don't you? That, no, it's absolutely the case. Um, in fact, one of the things I'm, I find most exciting about this particular Bible study, uh, this Lexio on Mary, was how, how deeply Catholic ancient Christian beliefs about Mary were, mm. and how deeply biblical they were. Uh, and it's precise because ancient Christians, unlike a lot of modern Christians who tend to like the New Testament, but not like the Old Testament so much because it's, it's old and it's long and it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So they read the whole Bible. And, and as I show in my book on Mary as well and in this series, 
um, those ancient Christian beliefs about Mary's sinlessness, about her bodily assumption into heaven, about her perpetual virginity are very, very Catholic. And not just in ancient Latin Christianity in the West, but Eastern Christianity as well. You know, it, it, that idea of what, how many of the church fathers say these doctrines. Yeah. I remember I love to take, take people on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And oh, when yeah. you go to the Basilica of the Annunciation, and you're going up from the lower crypt where the Annunciation happened, uh -huh. and you're walking the stairwell up to the upper crypt, there is, uh, on the wall in Latin, mm -hmm. which is the, or, or Greek, yeah. is the phrases of the Latin and Greek fathers in the original oh, language wow. about Our Lady. What? And oh, so wow. people That's always ask me, what does that say? What does that say? And then you, I, I love to show, well, he, this is a, an early church father mm -hmm. who's talking about our, the Blessed Mother. Wow. That's and fantastic. you see what these early Christians say about Our Lady, which is a, a powerful testimony. It is. And, and, and um, the reason they saw it, to restate the point, is <clears throat> because they recognize that you have to read the, old, the New Testament in light of the old. Now, I think most Christians, like most Protestant Christians, would, would admit, well, of course you need to do that when we're talking about Christ. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, Catholics and Protestants will agree that Jesus isn't just the Messiah. He's also the new Adam, right? Yeah. He, he fulfills that prefiguration mm -hmm. of Adam in the Old Testament. He's a new David, right? He's a new king who's come to inaugurate a kingdom. He's also a new Solomon who's greater than Solomon and brings us a wisdom. So lots of Christians new can... Isaac. Yeah, new Isaac, new, new... And if you don't know the story of Isaac carrying the wood up the mountain, the, you miss what's yeah, going on yeah, with Yeah, you miss what's going on with the cross. So lots of Christians are familiar with typology, mm -hmm. the study of Old Testament types or prefigurations and their New Testament fulfillments when it comes to Jesus. But what they don't realize, many don't realize, is that Jesus isn't the only person who's prefigured in the Old wow. Testament. Mary is also prefigured in the Old Testament. So uh, that not only does the New Testament reveal that Jesus is the new Adam, it also reveals that Mary is the new Eve. And it doesn't just reveal that Jesus is the manna, the new manna from heaven, like in John chapter six, it also reveals that Mary is the new Ark, Ark. of the Covenant that contained yeah. the manna. So what I do in the Lectio series is work through these various types, mm. these prefigurations of Mary in the Old Testament. Eve, um, the Ark of the Covenant, the Queen Mother, mm. uh, Rachel, mm. and I show how these various women as well as events and, 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 and elements like the Ark are not just part of salvation history. They point forward to and are fulfilled in Mary. And when you begin to do this typology, not just with Jesus, but with Mary, it's very exciting and it leads to Catholic conclusions. I love that. And I want to invite everybody to join us on the text line. So you can join by just texting your questions for Dr. Petrie and myself uh, at 720-650-0100. And just put your name and what your question is and join our conversation. We want you to be part of this. And that's always part of uh, our show here at the Augustine Institute. So, Brant, let's just, I mean, you, you give a, a list of great yeah, sure, things, sure. Uh, uh, great typologies. And what I love about your Bible study and your book is that you're very systematic, right? You start with... I have a lot of German in me, so I, li <laughs> yeah. I like things to be ordered. <laughs> I love the order, though. It's so great for people to learn as they walk through. You're walking them through Scripture with the major types with Mary. So let's just start with Eve. Okay. Uh, you know, because... Um, Obviously, Eve is really important, and, and Paul is always talking about Jesus as the new Adam, right? Yeah, and absolutely. You get that in Romans, you get it in Corinthians. Right. I mean, it's so important that Jesus, is, that for Paul, Jesus is the whole new Adam, and mm -hmm. therefore a whole new humanity. Right. Now, how do we understand that Mary is in God's plan a new Eve? Yeah. Um, well, there are several texts in the New Testament mm -hmm. that would point to this, but for me, uh, the place I like to start with is the Gospel of John. This is really where it's clearest. In two key episodes where Mary appears, the wedding at Cana and then the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. And one of the things you'll notice about both those episodes it, that's strange, that's unusual, is that Jesus, when he speaks to Mary, doesn't call her Mary and he doesn't call her mother. He calls her woman. He addresses her as gune in Greek, the word woman. And when you're reading it as an English speaker, you think, oh, man, this sounds rude, right? Yeah. It sounds like Jesus is dishonoring his mother, right? Because I know if I called my mother a woman, it would not be good, <laughs> right? Go right, Mom? It wouldn't be good. But, but whenever you see something strange like that, in, in context, it's almost invariably some key to unlocking it in the Old Testament. Well, if you go back to the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and 2, although we always think of her as Eve, which she is named in Genesis chapter 3, that's actually not the primary way of referring to the first woman. Yeah. 
12 times before that in Genesis 2, she's called woman, 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 over and over again. So that in a sense, the word woman is the principal name for the first woman of the first creation, Eve, right? So when you look at um, the Gospel of John, there's a lot of uh, detail I can't go into right now, but basically the first couple of chapters of John are actually modeled on the book of Genesis. It begins with the words, in the beginning, just like Genesis, and it kind of culminates in the miracle of the wedding at Cana. So mm -hmm. when Jesus is being revealed in, in John chapter 1 as the one who's going to bring a new creation, who's like the new Adam, and then he calls his mother Gune, woman, yeah. the same word used to refer to Eve. Since ancient times, Christian readers and modern scholars have recognized what is happening is that Jesus isn't just being revealed as the new Adam, who's going to bring a new creation, but Mary is the new Eve. I love that. And yeah. that's where you, you can join that context. Knowing the Old Testament background for Eve being called woman, yes. and then knowing the early church fathers who interpret that together. Oh, absolutely. You see the continuity and here. And what they're going to say, the, the ancient Christians will say is, just as death comes into the world by Eve's initiation of eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, so Mary brings life into the world, not just through the, her giving birth to Christ in the incarnation, but also she invites him mm. to perform his first public miracle, his mm. first sign that's going to begin the revelation of his Messiahship. So Eve invites and Adam I, to, to I, bring I death into that. the world, and, I, and Mary yeah, invites him to bring and salvation. I love it. In Luke's Gospel, you have an angel approaching Mary, mm -hmm. right, asking for her fiat, and then you had an angel, a fallen angel, approaching Approaching, approaching Eve. Eve. And so, right. I don't know if you've seen, we have a great image, an eye uh, painting of the Annunciation that we just got here at the Augustus oh, no, Institute. I seen this. And, uh, and so, we, it tries to show uh, Mary as the new Eve. In fact, it, it has several symbolisms in the painting oh, that's that fantastic. point that out. But it, in the background of uh -huh. where Mary's encountering the angel is uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and an, and an olive tree as the sign for the tree of life. Oh, so it's that's kind of beautiful, a, right. But and that, then, then that actually fast forwards to the crucifixion scene because if you thought Jesus was dishonoring his mother in the wedding at Cana, which of course he wouldn't because he'd be breaking the fourth commandment, which as a rule, <laughs> if, you're, if yeah, your interpretation if leads you to think Jesus breaks the commandments, you're probably wrong. Yep. Uh, but he does it on the cross as well. That's right. Right? And so what happens is, just like you have a man, a woman, and the tree at the fall of humanity, mm. you have a man... Christ, the woman, and the new Eve, and then the, the true tree of life, which is going to be the wood of the cross. That's so beautiful. And this is what I think asking these questions and getting deeper into the biblical story right. gets us to what you said before. Catholics oftentimes know the what, but they don't always realize the why. The why. That's right. And that's where the spark is. Because when you, when you see the why, yeah. it gets your faith on fire. That's exactly right. So, for example, in this case, why do Catholics believe in the Immaculate Conception of Mary? The idea that Mary, through a singular grace of God, was mm. conceived in the womb of her mother without the stain of original sin. People say, how can you believe that about Mary? Isn't she fully human? And we, you know, yeah. no human is without sin except Christ. And, and, and I'll say, say nope. nope, actually that's not true. There yep. are two other humans created yep. without sin, created very good in the Bible. And it's Adam yep. and Eve in the book of Genesis. It's, it's so important because I think so many Protestants think that we, our devotion to Mary makes her larger than reality. No. And yep. we make her quasi-divine. And so the idea that Mary would be without sin means she's got to be divine, but that's not the case at all. Not a, unless and you Eve think, is a perfect example. Of that's that. exactly right. So if Adam and Eve could be created without sin yep. and still be fully it's, human, exactly, yep. then it's fitting that in the new covenant, yeah. you wouldn't just have Christ, the new Adam, who without is without sin. sin, but that you would also have mm. a new Eve who is without sin. And one, real quick, so notice, and if she is the new Eve and she was created with sin then the old Eve would be greater than the new. And that's not how typology works, mm. right? So for Mary to be the new Eve, mm. if the first Eve was created without sin, then the new Eve has to be, better. Has to be greater. So yeah. she is uh, without sin as well. Oh, I love that. Well, there, there's a, a, a question that uh, Mark asks, and he says, you know, given the Protestant Reformation, yeah. why do Protestants <laughs> reject Mary? Okay, um, well, there, I mean, we could get into a number of reasons. Because Luther doesn't all together right away. It's really the second generation that's, that's going right. to That's right. So some of the first generation reformers actually held to many of Catholic doctrines about Mary and even held to certain devotions to Mary, but it quickly fades away. And I think part of the reason is, well, let's look at Luther. How did Luther feel about the Old Testament? 
Was he exceedingly positive about the Old Testament? And the answer is no. He drew a stark contrast between law and gospel. And how did Luther feel about tradition, yeah. right? The, the, the tradition of the church fathers. He also rejected that, and his clarion call was sola scriptura. So once you start rejecting or looking only negatively at the Old Testament, and once you start rejecting the witness of the ancient Christians, you're going to lose the context mm. that allows you to see the truth about Mary that's being revealed in the New Testament, mm. but can only be really seen clearly if you read it in light of the Old. One of the things I, I was fascinated by, just studying a little bit of the Reformation period, is that the devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows grows significantly mm -hmm. and, and, and as a response to the Reformation. Because one of the things that the Reformation says is, all, all this Catholic art of Mary holding the baby Jesus, mm -hmm. well, doesn't Jesus say, you know, when a woman says, blessed are the breasts oh, right. that, sure. that bore you and, and nursed you, and... Um, and Jesus says instead, blessed rather is she who does the will of God. Mm -hmm. Here's the word and, and does, does it, it yeah. and does it, right? Well, the response became Our Lady of Sorrow's devotion and images of Mary at the foot of the cross and, mm -hmm. you know, in sorrow because she, there she is as a disciple faithful to Jesus during the Passion, right? Oh, wow. And I... so there's a sense of, okay, yeah, Mary is there at the infancy, right. but Mary's there at the cross, mm -hmm which I think is a really beautiful response. No, it, it is, and that. I, I, I wasn't aware of that connection, although I, I would like to look into it further because my probably my favorite uh, lecture in the series, and my, definitely my favorite chapter on the Mary Rachel, mm. where I try to show that just as Rachel in the Old Testament was the mother of Israel, right? She's the wife of Jacob and the, the, the matriarch. She's the mother of the people of Israel. And in Jewish tradition, in Scripture, was in, regarded as the mother of sorrows, a sorrowful mother. Oh, course, like in yeah. Jeremiah 31, yeah. it says, Rachel weeping for her children yeah. because they are no more. I show in the book that that description, that biblical description of Rachel as a woman of sorrows and a mother in Jeremiah 31 and in, and in the book of uh, Genesis, goes on in Jewish tradition to lead to Rachel being venerated as the mother of Israel and as the, the mother whose prayers have a particular power mm. of intercession because she suffers with her children of Israel mm. and prays to God for them. So this is this great rabbinic tradition, ancient rabbis, they had the story of how the people of Israel were suffering and Moses interceded for them with God and God said no. And then Abraham interceded for them with God and God said no. But when Rachel, the sorrowful mother, interceded for him, mm. the, 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 the genuinity, the, the, the authenticity of her mother's pain wow. moves the heart of God to answer her prayers. So Rachel's prayers are the most powerful of all. And there's even, as you know, to this day, a shrine to Rachel, yeah. right? Rachel's tomb is a holy site. Yeah. Uh, and, and we even have evidence of some Jews going there and asking for her intercession, right? Yeah, right so, on the outskirts of Bethlehem. Right on the outskirts of Bethlehem. That's where, that's exactly right. So, now, take that fast forward to the New Testament. When Mary has Christ, of course, what follows is the massacre of the infants mm -hmm. near Bethlehem. And what does Matthew say? He yeah. quotes Jeremiah 31 about Rachel weeping, weeping for, for her children. children. And even Jewish scholars have said, like uh, Jacob Neusner and David Flusser have recognized, that Mary appears to be being depicted in Matthew as a kind of new Rachel. Mm -hmm. Now, if Matthew sees Mary that way, mm -hmm. then... It, it makes so much sense that very early on, Christians would begin asking Mary, who's not dead, but alive in heaven, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's why we call it eternal life, not eternal yeah. death. Yeah. Um, begins ask, the early Christians began asking Mary, we have evidence in the second, third century, of them asking for her to pray for them. Just like there was this tradition of uh, Rachel acting as Our Lady of Sorrows, a Mother of Sorrows, and an intercessor. I, I love that. I, I know one of my friends, that was their favorite chapter. Oh, they really? totally, never heard that before. Yeah. It totally blew them away. And uh, it, it's, it's just so great. People have to go back and dive in more to find out about that. Well, here's a question that is typical. Okay. Uh, Ryan asks, well, why do Catholics believe that Mary is a perpetual virgin when it mentions Jesus' siblings, that Jesus has brothers and sisters? Yeah. So I, I have a, this is one of my favorite chapters in the book. Um, there's a whole chapter just on that question with a specific focus on the perpetual virginity of Mary and the brothers of Jesus. So mm -hmm. I can't do it justice in, sure. in a nutshell yep, yep. here. But let me, let me put it this way. Um, in brief, many Catholics will rightly respond by saying that in uh, ancient Greek and in Hebrew, the word brother did not only mean 
uh, a uterine brother, like the, the mm -hmm. son of the same mother. Yeah, well, like Lot and Genesis. Like Lot, is called, Lot and Genesis, is, is Abraham. Nephew, but he's called Adelphos. Exactly, Genesis 14, he okay. does that. So he calls him brother. But many, many times that will seem like kind of special pleading to our non-Catholic friends because they'll look at Mark chapter 6, where mm -hmm. it mentions the brothers of Jesus, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and it mentions his sisters in the context of saying, hey, isn't this the son of Mary, and these are his brothers and sisters, and don't we know them? Who is this guy who's coming and performing these works? So they'll say, well, look, in context, it looks like these people are the brothers of Jesus. So I think it's not enough to just say that the word brother could mean cousin. What you have to actually show is, if you read Mark's gospel in context, it, it is the best proof for those guys not being his brothers but being his cousins, because if you fast forward to Mark 15, the same two guys, James and Joseph, who are called the brothers of Jesus in Mark 6, are later identified in Mark as the sons of a woman named Mary, but who is called the other Mary, right? Yeah. Not the mother of Jesus. So, in other words, the gospel themselves tell you that the brothers of Jesus are the children of another woman named Mary, who's at the foot of the cross, right? and who John's gospel in chapter 19 identifies as Mary, the wife of Clopas. And so when you put all the data of the gospels together, right, um, Matthew, Mark, and John, it's very clear that James and Joseph, Simon and Judas, these guys who are called his brothers, that's just a Semitic way of referring to his cousins, and they're the children not of the Virgin Mary, mm -hmm. but of another Mary. And by the way, ancient Christians all knew this. If you read Eusebius' yeah. church history, yeah. Hegesippus was an early church historian. They knew that James, the bishop of Jerusalem, and Simon, two of the brothers, were actually the sons of a man named Clopas, who was Jesus' uncle. So this was not like some cryptic secret knowledge. Yeah. This was just public knowledge. But as Christianity moved into Gentile spheres, where people didn't understand that Semitic language of brothers, it became garbled and people became confused about who these men were. Yeah, it's such a great explanation, and it just reminds me of, you know, there's a lot of Protestants that don't understand Marian devotion, but there's just as many Catholics who don't understand Marian devotion that's, that's and the biblical right. roots of it, right? That's absolutely and right. It, for us Catholics, I think Catholics sometimes get like, well, why don't the Protestants understand this? Well, it's because we Catholics aren't able to answer dinner conversations when Protestant friends ask us, right. and we can't give the why. But if Catholics could explain the why, that's exactly there won't right. be any, many Protestants left. I think. <laughs> no, the, I mean, if we well, could, if Catholics can articulate the biblical reasons for our faith. No, I think that's the unity between Protestants and Catholics is going to grow. Is going to grow because significantly. The, because Mary, I know this from personal experience. Because Mary is one of the greatest impediments. Like, yeah. and it's not Mary herself, but, but a point of division for the Protestants. The beliefs about Mary, I have Protestant friends and family who have become Catholic, and they said Mary was the greatest hurdle because it's they for them. The, the beliefs about Mary seem so patently unbiblical. Mm -hmm. And because so many Catholics aren't able to explain how they're biblical, yeah. it really just seems like they're, that their beliefs that we just close our eyes and say, well, the church says so, and I believe it even though, you know, I know it isn't true or whatever. Or, it's not biblical, but I'm going to believe it anyway. I know many Catholics who get nervous when they hear those passages about the brothers of Jesus in, in the lectionary and, and mass, but they don't know how to explain them. So that's what this book's for. Mm -hmm. That's what the Lexio Bible study is for. Well, and I, I really encourage people in, in, in our audience that if you want to help Catholics understand Mary, get a Bible study group. Maybe start it yourself. You know, if you know there's a Bible study group in your parish, tell them, hey, you, we've got to do this Lexio Mary Bible study. And you can get this at Catholic.market. Uh, Catholic.market sells it. It's also on the forum platform. Yeah. And uh, you can also get uh, Dr. Peter's book, The Jewish Roots of Mary, uh, at Catholic.market. So please um, go, go there, find these resources, get the book, and watch this series because we've got to get Catholics to understand and know their mother. This is really important. So that they can evangelize because this is this is the barrier oftentimes with Catholics and Protestants, a, and we don't need that. We don't need that barrier. It's a huge barrier. And I love that you said to get to know their mother because, you know, one of the things I try to show in this series is that Mary isn't, at the end of the day, Mary isn't a doctrine. Mary isn't yeah. a dogma. Mary is a person. Yeah. She's a real person who Jesus, in his last words, gave to us through John to be his mother. I mean, his last will and testament, one of the last things he said was to John, actually, he said uh, to John, behold your mother, and then to Mary, 
behold your son. And, and, and just as just as he doesn't use Mary's name, Mary, he uses right. mother. He uses yeah. He uses for John. Actually, yeah, right, woman. No, actually, so yeah, woman. woman. Sorry, and, yeah. But he also for John, he he doesn't. He, mm. to, to the he looked at the disciple whom he, he loved. loved. Yeah, that's true. So he didn't just look at John. He looked at us because we're all invited to be that disciple. That's he right. stands for us. Then that's right. Yeah, the ancient Christians saw this very clearly that, that John, the beloved disciple, in the Gospel, of John is a kind of figure or type in which we're supposed to see ourselves, mm -hmm. right? We all should w strive to become beloved disciples of Jesus. And when Jesus gives Mary to John to be her mother, he's giving her not just to John, but to all of his disciples. And if you have any doubts about this, you can go to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, yeah. where the mother of the Messiah, the woman clothed with the son, it says that um, the devil went off to persecute her children, the rest, the rest of her, her children, offspring. Yep. her yep. offspring, yep. who are those who believe in Christ, who yeah, believe in that, Jesus. That is what, that's my favorite Marian verse. It's Revelation 12, verse 17. 17. Go look it up. And it says, you know, went to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who bear witness, witness. To, Martyria, bear yeah. witness to Jesus yeah. and obey the commandments of God. That's exactly right. And so, in other words, it, it's clearly identifying that the children of Mary are those who bear witness to Jesus That's right. and obey God's commandments. Yep. And it, it's not about uh, genetics. Nope. It's not about natural birth order. It's about... And it's not about denomination. Or Every denomination. Christian, it's yeah. about a spiritual order here. That's exactly right. Of loving right. Jesus. If, if, if you, know, you love Christ and you want to obey the commandments of the Father, yeah. Mary's your mother. Yeah, whether you know it or not, so she's beautiful. your yeah. mother. She's your mother. You know... Um, Diane asks, you know, Mary seems to be without free will or temptation. Can you comment on that? And I think probably what Diane's thinking about, if Mary doesn't sin, she can't really be free. Yeah. But that's not true, is it? No, that's not true. Otherwise, we're not free in heaven. That's, that's <laughs> my answer to this always. So wait a second. Um, are we going to sin in heaven? Say no. no. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, so does that mean we lose our freedom? No. In fact, what heaven is, it's the perfection of our freedom yeah. because God gives us our freedom precisely in order to choose the good. Mm -hmm. And so what Mary and all the saints in heaven, who are all sinless, by the way, yeah. and yeah. don't stop being human. So if yep. you say, oh, you can't be sinless to be human, we have a problem <laughs> because the saints in heaven are still human. But what, what they do is that through God's grace, their freedom is perfected so that they choose God and they choose the good for all eternity. Oh, and I don't know about it. you, but that sounds pretty good to I, me. I'd yeah, like to do I, I'm that. ready for the perfection of freedom. Ready for right do that. Now. Yeah, ready for that. Bring it, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah bring it. Yeah, that, absolutely. That is, it's so glorious. But you yeah. know, that's the beauty of our faith. Brent, just to end with, you know, you, you, you spent a lot of time praying and studying on this. How, in doing the book and, and doing this study and studying Our Lady and realizing Mary is your mother, hmm. how did it lead you to be a more devoted to Jesus Christ? Because I think a lot of people think Marian devotion is a parallel track to devotion to Jesus, but it doesn't have to be that way. Marian devotion should lead us to be a more devoted disciple of our Lord, right? Absolutely, yeah. So um, for me personally, um, would, this, would this study help me realize something the Catechism says that I knew as a doctrine, but I, I, mm. I, I really deepened it. Uh, I penetrated that teaching more deeply, it says, the Catechism says, everything that the Catholic Church believes and teaches about Mary is based on what she believes and teaches about Christ. Mm. And so it, it has only made my grasp of who Jesus is more splendid, more profound. So, for example, by realizing Mary is um, the new Eve, it's helped me understand, oh, Jesus isn't just the Messiah. He's the new Adam. Mm -hmm. He comes to inaugurate a whole new creation. Mm -hmm. uh, by focusing on Mary as the, the queen mother, it's helped me realize that Jesus didn't just come to set up like a new institution. He's a king. He reigns as a king. And I'm a subject that belongs to this yeah. heavenly kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in recognizing Mary as the, mm -hmm. the new uh, the, well, I have a whole chapter on this, too, but on, as the new Rachel, mm. the sorrowful mother, yeah. it helps me realize that Jesus is also the new Joseph, mm. right? The, the beloved son of Rachel. Yeah, who, who suffers. Who suffers, mm. who's and betrayed, betrayed by, his, by his 11 brothers, one named Judah, right? Whoa. Sold for 20 pieces of silver, yeah. right? And goes down into the pit mm. only to emerge mm. and to rise to the highest throne ah. and then save the world, Israel and the Gentiles, by feeding them with what? The wheat. So this is what Christ does. He's the new Joseph who feeds the world and saves us with the bread. Brandon, I'm, I'm so glad you shared this. I, I can't believe our time is up, but I, I just want to encourage people. 
you know, just from what Brent was just saying, you know, the more we understand Mary in Scripture, the more we're going to understand Jesus Christ. And that's the goal. Yep. That is the goal. And so Marian devotion leads to devotion to Jesus. And I always think personally of John, the beloved disciple, is the only one at the cross because he's with Our Lady. Mm -hmm. He's with Mary. And Mary helps John have the courage to be there at the cross. And if we become truly devoted to Mary, she will give us the courage to take up the cross in our own lives and to follow Jesus Christ where he, wherever he calls us. And I want to thank you all for joining us uh, it's been a great pleasure to talk about oh, the thanks, Blessed yeah, Mother yeah. with you, Brant. Yeah. It's a great joy to have My you on pleasure. the show. Thank you for being with us. Always a pleasure. Yeah, and I, next week we're going to do, so many of you ask, you know, you love these shows, we just do question and answer. So next week I'm going to do a question and answer episode with Dr. Ben Akers. We always enjoy those. We're always happy to have your questions and have you participate in the show. Thank you so much for being a part of this, and thanks. Special thanks to all of you who support us through the Mission Circle, our monthly giving society. It helps us have this ministry. God bless you.